Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a wonderful and engaging new novel called Anything is Good by Fred Waitzkin. Fred was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1943, went to Kenyon College, did graduate study at NYU. His other books include Searching for Bobby Fischer, which you may have seen as a movie, uh, Deep Water Blues, Strange Love, Mortal Games, The Last Marlin, and The Dream Merchant. His work has been in Esquire, New York Magazine, New York Times Sunday Magazine, New York Times Book Review, Outside, Sports Illustrated, Forbes, Huffington Post, Daily Beast, etc. And he lives in New York City. Fred Waitzkin, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Thanks very much for coming on. I very much enjoyed uh, reading this book, and I very much enjoyed the film of Searching for Bobby Fischer. Didn't uh, read the book yet. Um, this is a, a very different topic about uh, a childhood friend who ends up homeless and the world of those without homes. How did you, how did you come to write this? Well, um... You know, uh, um, several years ago, I was in between books. That's always a delicate moment in my life because moving from one book for the next moment, well, moving from one book for the next book is always, um, I don't know if threatening is the right word. It's always a challenge. And there's always worry attending, attending to that. Will I find another book that moves me? But it just so happened that um, I lost two of my closest friends um, and I was morose about it. These were really um, soulmate friends. And I happened to think about my old friend in high school. Uh, he was my best friend and I hadn't spoken to him in several years. So I decided to give him a phone call. And uh, he, he was living in a, in a tiny little place in Fort Lauderdale. I knew that, but I didn't know if he was still alive. I hadn't spoken to him in three years. I gave him a ring on the phone and we started to talk. And I just asked him without having a, a particularly ethereal motivation, Tell me about tell me about the life you, li you lived. I, there's a lot I don't know about what happened after high school. And um, he hemmed and hawed and he said he couldn't remember it. And I pushed him and pushed him. And, and eventually he started remembering. And he told me the story that completely blew my mind. I mean, it was one of the most amazing stories I'd ever heard. So that's how the, that's how the idea was born. It is quite an amazing story about a super intelligent person, uh, close friends with uh, well-known academics, uh, ends up homeless. And he talks about having been faking it, about not having been normal, everything having been strange and not knowing how to behave with other people and faking it. it and it seems, the book seems to be somewhat about how little we know other people and what might really be going on in the minds of people we know or are close to. Is this, is this the, the theme you had in mind when you started this? Um, I can't say that I had any theme in mind when I started it. I was just um, riveted by the story. You know, one of the things that I've come to um, spending many, many years writing, writing um, magazines in articles and essays and, and novels and memoirs is that to write a book that is going to have a chance to engage the imagination of readers, you have to have a great story. I mean, you can be a terrific writer. You can be one of the best writers on the planet. You could be Marcel Proust. But in this day and age, I don't think Marcel Proust would have many readers either. You have to have a good story. And Ralph told me a story that completely blew my mind. It was such an engaging and unlikely story that, that that's really what hooked me on it. I think Marcel Proust would be told he's too long-winded uh, and needs, yeah. to, needs to get with the times, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh -oh. the, the beginning is about uh, the childhood of, of the main character, your, your friend, Ralph. And uh, I, I couldn't help wondering how different it would have been today uh, rather than so many decades ago. I, I am imagining the diagnoses he would have been fitted with and the drugs that would have been uh, prescribed. Do you think it would have been very different, uh, that child in these days? I don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, 
as high school students, I mean, Ralph was strange. There's no question about it. I mean, I was, I was, um, I was, in, I was a literary person. I, I loved to read books, but at the same time, I was hooked on sports. And my other best friend was a championship basketball player, one of, one of the best players in the city. And and I followed sports. I watched sports. And Ralph was weird. I mean, he didn't understand sports. He, he didn't understand business. My father was a salesman, and I really, really loved business. Um, and and but he had this way of talking about life and himself. He talked about himself as an alien, that he came from a different place. And I thought that was cool because I was into progressive jazz and I was into people like Thelonious Monk and Charlie Mingus. And I thought that they were from another world along with Ralph. So I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was so weird. I, I, I think when I knew Ralph in high school, I don't think he would have been, um, if, he, if it were the same Ralph today, I don't think he would have been dragged off to go into some kind of institution. Maybe he would have had some therapy because he was so smart that he was good at pretending with other people that he could, he could talk the language of other, other folks, even though inside, you know, he had different ideas about things. Um, yeah. So, so it, it was, it was, I found him to be an extremely attractive person. And then, um, and then the story developed. I mean, you know, the story in our lives and in the story, the way he told me the story. I mean, I, I gradually discovered things about him that I didn't have any clue about. I mean, our friendship took place in my mother's apartment. I never went to his house, or maybe I went to his house one time. But then when I started talking to him about what he was doing during those years when we were best friends, I found out that his father was a, a kind of illegal um, businessman. I mean, he owned 14 office buildings in New York City. Um, his, 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 um, his partner was Sammy the Bull Gravano, the same guy that, you know, admitted to 19 murders. Um, I found out that he, um, that his father um, um, was a bigamist, that he had a second family with five kids in upstate New York. I found out that his father owned the house that Errol Flynn used to live in. None of these things I knew before I started writing the book. So I really didn't know the guy I was writing about in a certain way. I knew about it in some ways, but I didn't know about it in other ways. Did you know he was friends with a bird? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. He shared the intimacy of his life, the, for lack of a better word, the dark side of his life to me. Once we started talking about the book, you know, when we were both older guys, I didn't know about any of that weird stuff. We were friends. Yeah. So, so when he started telling me the story, I thought, oh, oh my God. I mean, there's so many levels to this story. He was my best friend. But he was a stranger. I mean, my best friend who I didn't know anything about. And, um, and then, of course, the story takes an astonishing turn. I mean, I, you know, we have to talk about that a little bit because we're on this wonderful program, but I don't want to talk about it too much. I mean, what happened was that, what happened was that um, his father ultimately lost all 14 office buildings. And my friend at this point, who was, you know, in his late 20s, was, uh, quite a, an esteemed philosopher. He was hanging out with some of the most brilliant people in the world. Saul Kripke, for example, along with John Stuart Miller, considered maybe the two greatest philosophers of the 20th century. And Saul Kripke was a good friend of Ralph's. And they used to talk about elements in philosophy that a guy like myself would never understand. Um, they were into something called modal logic. There are only a handful, a handful of people in the world that understand what modal logic is. And, um, when Ralph lost everything, um, and that's a story in itself, how he transitioned from living in a small house in Florida, to becoming an outcast, lived, lived, lived on the street. It was a remarkable story in itself. But once he found himself on the street with, without eyeglasses, and he couldn't see without eyeglasses, and without any money in his pocket, and without wearing shoes, he had to learn how to survive. And he survived in the most remarkable way for 20 years. Yeah, it's it's it is an incredible story. Um, he and you were you were somewhat in touch with him, right? You would get collect calls. You visited him. He didn't want money, uh, but 
I, I don't know. What do you do? What what did you do? And what should one do in such a circumstance uh, for someone who may or may not want any help? Well, you know, that that's also a, a, a an extremely interesting question that I think the book addresses. I mean, um, the on, on a certain level, the book is about two different realities. The Fred character in the book um, is like a lot of people that live in cities all over the United States today. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I don't know where you're located now, where we're talking, but I'm, I'm in the middle of New York City. I'm on 28th Street in Manhattan. Right. And when you walk out, out the front door of my office building, I have an office, it's very silent. It's a great place to write books. When you walk out of the, when you walk out of, out of the front door of my, of my building, You'll see that the street is lined with flowers. It's a flower. The whole block is a flower. Is a flower shop. Is a is a flower shop. There's one beautiful flower story after the next. But in between these stores are homeless people. So homeless people are sleeping between the flowers. And and likewise, if you come down to where I live in Soho, um, and you you come outside my apartment building, and you walk onto the street. There's a beautiful little a little park with, you know, 15 or 18 benches. And it's a place where my, I brought my children up, where children, you know, get strolled by their mommies and, and where kids learn how to play football. But there's also several of those benches that are inhabited by homeless folks that are, sleep, that are sleeping on the benches. Now, the thing is, when you live in a place like New York, you see these people, but you don't really see them. They're not seen. You look at them, but they're not seen. And, and when I wrote this book, um, I decided, it happened kind of naturally, but I, I realized that it was a valuable way to think of it. The Fred character in the book is a person that doesn't see the homeless people. In other words, he, he lives in New York City, but he doesn't realize that there's a subterranean world that they inhabit, that, you know, that, they, that they have sorrow, that they have ecstasy, that they have hunger that they have despair, um, that they have lovers. You don't think of it that way. You just see them as street furniture, leaning against the post, um, and you just walk past them. Or you, or you might give them a dollar if they ask for it. But you don't really think about them. That was part of the story that I wanted to tell. So the Fred character in the book is that character, the person that really didn't see homeless people. And the, and, and, and the, and the Ralph character in the book as it turns out, it is a sage. By the time you get to the end of the book, and I'm being very careful not to talk about the story, the story itself, except in broad sweeping terms so that we can have this lovely program. It turns out to be a sage. He's a person that still has his great intelligence, that is still charismatic, and that sits with literally hundreds of homeless people and tries to help them survive on the street by comfort, by counsel. And, and then eventually, at certain points in the book, the Fred character, and the Ralph character come together. Like for example, um, there's one scene where um, Fred comes and sees his friend living um, in a in a glade of broken beer cans, and prophylactics, and and soiled blankets, and, and 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 Ralph smells like the worst person in the world. And they sit there in this glade together, and Fred tries to say about how how great it is to see you and it's great to have a talk with you, but his friend smells and, and then he notices that there's a knife thrust in a tree. And when Fred notices that the knife thrust in the tree, he's thinking about surviving this little visit with his friend. Fred's scared to death, he tries to get out of there. And then um, I'm telling you just, just a couple scenes to give you the feeling, but I'm not ruining the plot. And then during that same visit to Fort Lauderdale, Fred decides, He's going to take his friend Ralph out to a restaurant. So Fred thinks about when, when he used to visit Miami, I said Fort Lauderdale, but when, I, when Fred used to visit Miami with his dad, they always used to go out to a fancy steak restaurant. And, and Fred and his dad used to stay in the Fountain Blue Hotel because my dad was a, a wheeler and dealer salesman and he really loved the, the Fountain Blue Hotel. So I picked Ralph up in my, in my car and I was looking for a restaurant. I found a fancy steak restaurant. I stopped the car, I parked the car. And I walked into the front door with Ralph. And the hostess 
you know, was nonplussed. She didn't know whether to let us in or not because Ralph was black, filthy, and he smelled horribly. But she did let us in. We sat in the back of the restaurant. We had dinner. Our conversation was very stilted. I could only think of things to say that referred to our relationship 15 years earlier or 20 years earlier. I couldn't think of anything in the moment to connect with. So it was very, very tense, difficult. And then I decided, and then it was time, the evening was over. And I decided of, of course, I, I was gonna drive him home to where, to where he was staying. So I drove him back to this park. By the time we got there, there was a gale blowing. It must have, the wind must have been blowing 40 miles an hour. It was a summer gale in, in, um, in Miami Beach. And the rain was coming down torrentially. And Ralph opened the, the door of the car and got out. And before he'd walked 10 feet from the car, he was drenched, he was dripping with water. I'm thinking, how, can he, how is he gonna survive the night? And, I, 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 and I, I rolled down my window and what I wanted to do was to say to him, Ralph, get back in the car, man. Spend the night in the motel with me. But I didn't do it. And he walked off into the night. Because we were so, we were once so close and now we were so far away um, that it was even hard to connect emotionally. He was living in a different world. We are speaking with Fred Waitzkin, and the book is called Anything is Good. I highly recommend it. Uh, you mentioned that Ralph becomes something of a, of a counselor to all of these other people living outside on the street, uh, no homes, and it seems to be desperately needed. It seems they desperately need to talk to somebody. It seems there's a there's a gap in what uh, our society has has provided to these people that he was able to provide, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you've got it exactly. There's a terrible gap and it's still there. And it's still there. I mean, you know, uh, I, I read somewhere that, um, that, that the 200,000 200, homeless people have wandered into Manhattan in the last two and a half years. 200,000, that's a city. A city of homeless people have recently come into Manhattan. There's nothing for them. There's no places to, to sleep at the night. So they sleep on the, on the sidewalk, on the sidewalk um, between the flowers. Um, in, my, in my little park, which I referred to earlier across the street, there's this woman, her name is Vivian. And she and her husband were, sleep, were living on the park bench last winter. And um, they lived on the park bench underneath a green blanket. And I tried to give them food whenever I could. And every night I wandered downstairs to see whether or not they were still alive because my God, I mean, you know, imagine living on a bench, a park bench, two people living on a park bench, just a regular park bench. That's where they stayed. And sure enough, he died. And now she's still staying on the park bench. That's where Vivian lives, on the park bench. And she, uh, and, and she somehow manages to wrangle a few dollars so that she can eat something. And two days ago in the city, it rained torrentially, torrentially. It was like a Southern gale. Wind was blowing 40 miles an hour. Um, the rain was coming down in buckets and she was sitting on the park bench. I don't see how people stay alive like that. There, there are no answers. There are no, there are no a answers readily available. I don't know, I don't know what should be done. So this is a, this is a haunting problem in the United States today. And it wasn't, if I was being honorable, it wasn't my intention to write about it as a social problem. My, my intention was to write about it as a, as a personal story that had, that, had, that had legs, that would engage people. But now I see it as a, as a big problem. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what the hell people are gonna do. I mean, when you listen to our ex-president talk about the homeless people, he, he says they should all be put in a, locked up and put away and, you know, and, and um, shipped out of the country and, um, and put in stockades and, and without any, and, and he's not, you know, I don't mean to just single him out because I think homeless people are often dismissed as if they're not really alive. Let me give you another example, if that's okay. Should I, should I go on? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, towards the end of the book, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give away the ending. The, end, the ending kind of knocked me out to write it and to discover it. Um, Ralph is no longer living in, in the Miami area. He's moved north to Fort Lauderdale. And there's, a, and there's a, um, a park there where homeless people live. 
and um, and the park is has kind of like two people that are in control of the park. So, so these park communities sometimes have leaders. And and the two leaders are a guy by the name of Wayne, who's a tough guy, and his and his girlfriend, Melanie. And um, they have a lot of rules in the park. You can't rob, you can't rape, you can't hurt people inside the park. What we do outside the park, they don't care about. But inside the park, there's certain rules. And Ralph became very close to this woman, Melanie, over time. And he discovered that before she was a homeless person, she worked for Texas Instruments as a, as a computer scientist. Now, Ralph knew a lot about computers. Ralph can build a computer from the beginning. You can just put the parts on the table, and he today, still, he can build a computer. But Melanie knew more about computers than Ralph. It completely blew his mind that a woman living in the park knew more about the technology of computers and how to build them and fix them than he did. And this is the kind of thing he discovered in the park. There are remarkable people that are living in these parks. Anyway. Yeah. Well, it is uh, It is very much a personal story, and it seems some of Ralph's happiest days are when he's homeless. Uh, but as far as societal problems go, it seems like in the United States, often just about every other industrialized country in the world, without reaching perfection, has figured out generally a better way. And, and we say to each other, well, we don't know what to do about health care. How can we provide people with health coverage when you know every other wealthy nation on earth has more or less figured it out? And, and the same with housing. Uh, are we afraid to look at other countries that do a better job of providing people with housing? Maybe so. Maybe so. I mean, maybe that's it. I, I also think that probably the, um, and I, I hate to say this because I, have, you know, I'm fundamentally sympathetic to the plight, but probably the great numbers of people now that are, that are coming through the borders and that are drifting up to into the cities, is is also an unsolvable problem at this point. I mean, you know, there's, as I say, there's no place for them to live. They're living among the flowers on the concrete in New York and dying when it's cold outside. I mean, I can't imagine like in New York. Right? Where, where are you? Where, where, where I, are you now, David? I, I have lived you? in New York City myself as well, but I happen to live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Well, today in New York, it's 96 degrees. I mean, imagine imagine living on the con sleeping on the concrete today. Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, maybe worse in Miami. It may be worse in Miami. It's, yeah. it's it's so sad. And it's a, at the moment, an unanswerable question. There will be an answer, but an unanswerable question now. Well, we got to work on it. Uh, I hope this book will help people. I, you, you know, I recently read another book uh, by a guy named Jonathan Rosen called The Best Minds, a story of friendship, madness, and the tragedy of good intentions. I don't know if you've read this one, but it, it, it too is about a New Yorker looking back at a childhood uh, friend who in this case has mental illness uh, and it develops a story that the author is is largely unaware of and i are new yorkers now do new yorkers all have friends with problems or is every is everyone going to look around and and say which of my friends is really suffering some bizarre trauma that i don't know about and and how many of them would be right you know i think most of us are i think most of us aren't introspective in the, quite that way. I mean, I think that we live very, very personally and very, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking about good people now, not bad people. I mean, we have, com we have complicated lives. And, um, you know, during the period of time when Ralph was um, homeless and he was living in the park in Florida, you know, I was bringing up a family. Um, I was raising my daughter and my son in Manhattan. I was trying to make it as a professional writer, which is very, very challenging. I started off writing magazine articles for a lot of the big magazines. And while I was learning, how, that's really where, where I learned my chops, doing, doing journalism. That's where, I, that's where I learned to be a fiction writer. And, um, and yeah, I didn't have time. For, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I didn't have time for Ralph. I mean, I, did, I didn't have time to go down to Florida and, and, and see what he and Juliet and this incredible crew were doing in the, in the parks. And looking into it, I, I was thinking about, you know, my son's chess life. I was thinking about my my daughter's aspirations. You know, I was thinking about my relationship with my wife, you know, and, and the world goes on. I, I think that 
I think that's true about many people. And I think that today, when, when you look at the homeless sleeping on the concrete and on the benches, people don't have time for them. They're trying to survive. They're, they're trying to, to have love affairs. They're trying to get married. They're trying to deal with marital discord, you know, problems. Um, and so the hom homeless are, are, are forgotten. I mean, the world that Ralph put in my hand as an author was I'd, a world that I didn't even know existed. It's a subterranean world that lives outside the side of people like you and I, where all the factors are, the, are there. I mean, these people get sick. You know, they, 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 they drink bad water. That they search for food, they find hilarious ways to get food if they're lucky enough. Um, they meet people, they fall in love, they get beat up, they have tragedies. We don't think about any of that stuff. You know, we're thinking about our own lives. I don't think it's out of cruelty. I think it's just, you know, in a life, we only have so much focus. I mean, who, how, how many people right now are thinking about this next election that's coming up? Some of them are, but not too many, because people have their own concerns. Don't you think, to some extent? Certainly true. Um, I, I we got just a couple of minutes left, Fred Waitskin. Yeah. I wanted to ask about their, the the character Ralph in the story uh, is, is so intriguing, and and one of the things he does is constantly come up with inventions that could make a million dollars, but don't for some reason, and you don't know how real those are. But one of the things he invents is music that intox literally intoxicates people. And that seems to be real. Is that real? And if so, oh, why, has, why, why have I never heard this? Absolute, absolutely real. He came up with, he, st he started um, studying brain waves and he had like a, 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 a scientific setup in his, in his apartment. He had speakers and all sorts of, all sorts of um, gauges and, and, and things that I, did, I didn't even know what it was. But if you walked in there, you would, you would think you walked into a laboratory. And he was studying brain waves. And what he discovered were, was that by modulating brain waves in a certain way, he could mirror the feel of, of marijuana. And so he made a recording after working for a year at this called the Pythagorean. And, and he marketed it. It was on the market. And it was, it was reviewed in the New York Times. It was reviewed in uh, Rolling Stone magazine. Um, and um, uh, his inventions were real. I mean, he, he patented five or six things, but of course, when he fell off when he fell off the mountain and became a homeless person, it was impossible to, you know, to do the kinds of things with these things to to market them properly. But but the, the Pythagorean was a true thing. I, I I went to hear it many times. I, I am going to have to search for it. I imagine it's available on the internet somewhere, and uh, people are going to be searching for it when they read this book and, and, and numerous other topics when they read this book. The book is called Anything is Good by Fred Waitskin. Uh, Fred, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks for taking me. I really enjoyed our talk. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.